Today we're going to be looking at God's holiness. Now when it comes to holiness, holiness addresses how God's person and his character relate to the rest of the world, how they relate to things outside of them, especially when it comes to the philosophical um, idea of ontology, that is the nature of things or the state of being. And so it Holiness deals with the ontology of Jesus and God, and how, and how they, I have written, written down there how they relate to creation, or you can just say the world. And when we compare the two, what we see is God is far different than creation. God has things about him that are superior to creation. We basically call it holiness. Now, when it comes to defining holiness, I have on here five definitions that get progressively, relatively progressively shorter, except the shortest one's next to last. Um, these are from sources that I haven't necessarily quoted so far, but I wanted to introduce some others in there. Now, the first two are less of a definition of, of God's divine holiness and more of, well, the first one is kind of an explanation of what holy or holiness means. The second one actually defines sanctification, dealing, but deals also with the holiness of God. And so in that, and these are both from evangelical dictionaries or theological dictionaries. The first definition or explanation is from M. William Urey. Um, in, he's defining holy or holiness, and he says this. One does not define God. Roll credits. Yeah, <laughs> could have just stopped right there, but he didn't. He then proceeded to define things, <laughs> which is kind of funny. You don't define God, so here's how we're going to define God. <laughs> One does not define God. Similarly, the idea of holiness is at once understandable and elusive. Thanks. Okay. Nevertheless, there is not a term equal to the fullness inherent in holiness. All of heaven's hosts... Israel, and the church ascribe praise to a holy God because that idea sets him apart from everything else. Holiness is what God is. Well, that's helpful. Holiness also comprises his plan for his people. The universal description of the holy is that which is separated from the normal in a conceptual way. Yet, through revelatory instruction, Moses taught Israel that their conception of the holy affirmed an essential difference between themselves and deity. And that's all a mouthful. So we'll just go on and get to some more concise explanations or definitions. And uh, K, I don't know his first name, K. Bachmuel defines it this way. In biblical religion, the concept of the holiness of God is of paramount importance. It signifies his unblemished righteousness as well as his singular and radiant majesty. The Holy One cannot have communion with the unholy. Sinful humans can only approach him if they are sanctified, that is, made to correspond to his holiness. Now, I, I, I like this one because it actually gets into the separation between God and man. We have God who is holy, and if we're going to relate to God, because of his infinite holiness, we also must be holy, but the problem is we are unholy because of sin. And therefore, we're separated from God. We cannot commune with him on our own. This is what's what many in the world actually forget when they talk about, well, you know, you may have heard phrases, God and I, we're on terms, good terms. We've come to a deal. In fact, anybody remember the movie Forrest Gump? What did, um, what did Lieutenant Dan say after the thunderstorm? They've come to an agreement. He basically says, I'm going to be able to commune with God, yet, I'm, yet he's unholy. He can't. It's impossible. Something must change. In order for God and man to commune, in this state, either God must somehow, in some way, become unholy, which is impossible because he is the definition and personification of holiness, 
it's impossible for him to become unholy. So that's not an option. Or man must become holy. Well, since God can't become unholy, there's only two ways man can become holy. And we're talking philosophically here. So either man has to do it himself, he has to make himself holy, but think about it this way. Take the dirtiest sponge and try to clean that sponge with that sponge. Will it ever get clean? No, because it's, it's already dirty. It's going to be cleaning itself with its own dirtiness. So man can, that's like what man trying to fix himself. He can't do it. So someone outside man, in this case God, must do something so that man is holy, so that man can commune with God. That's called salvation. This is what happens with people through Christ Jesus. It is through him that we are declared righteous. We are made holy, sanctified by God. So because of what God does, we can commune with him. Now, continuing on, and Mueller, who I have used before, defines holiness this way. Divine holiness is that attribute of God by which he, conformably to his own law, desires all things that are right and good. In particular, God is holy, A, essentially, inasmuch as he is, by his divine essence, most supremely exalted over all creatures, in which sense holiness denotes God's supreme majesty and comprises all his other attributes. God is holy, B, efficiently, inasmuch as he is the author of all holiness and stands in direct opposition to sin. Grudem has the shortest definition, not the best in my opinion, but the shortest in this case. God's holiness means that he is separated from sin and devoted to seeking his own honor. Concise, clear. I prefer Got Questions Ministries' definition in this case. The holiness of God refers to the unparalleled majesty of his incomparable being and his blameless, faultless, unblemished moral purity. Holy also refers to something or someone that has been separated from the common or set aside for God's use. Pretty similar to Grudem's, but they expanded a little bit more, and I think that one's a better overall definition of God's holiness because it emphasizes the fact that God is the source, the definition, the personification, the everything when it comes to holiness. How do we know what holiness is? God. It also shows that there's a separation between the unholy and the holy. And it also shows that it is God that makes things holy so that they can be used by him for his purposes. So these are the definitions that I have here for holiness. What are the key points? There's three key points to get out of this. First, that which is holy is separate from the normal. Now, the normal I'm basically using as a catch-all term for creation, anything out in the world, whatever we consider normal life. So basically anything other than God. That which is holy is separate from everything else. God is the basis for understanding holiness. If we want to understand holiness, we have to understand who God is. Also, God is the arbiter of what is or is not holy. We don't define something as holy. We don't decide this thing or that thing is holy. God does. Anything that is holy, God has made holy. God has decided to declare or transform that thing to be holy. Now, when we look at holiness from a biblical standpoint, there is actually a lot of imagery in the Bible that we can look at to understand holiness. The one that I'm going to focus on is one that we see throughout, especially the Pentateuch, and it is, any ideas what I'm drawing there yet? Almost. This is a top. This is a top view of it. So we would have, looking at it from straight above, over here we would have door or a curtain. This is the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle, which is a foreshadowing of the temple, both of which have a lot of foreshadowings in them. One of them meaning uh, being the church. So, but we're going to look mostly at the tabernacle slash temple, which I'm going to combine into one in this case because I don't, I don't want to say a tabernacle temple all the time. So we're just going to say tabernacle. But, the, but God's holiness is 
pictured in this uh, structure. What do we have on it? Well, we have, this is the outside, okay? This is the world, a.k.a. sinners. That's the world. Outside of the tabernacle. Inside the tabernacle, here we have the court. Now, later on in the temple, there's the two courts, courts of the Gentiles, courts of the Jews. Well, inside of here, the people of God. Now, the world all around them, but separated from the world, are the people of God. What's separating them? Well, the tabernacle, it was this basically cloth with this doorway or this veil here. Oh, and by the way, prophetically, that doorway is Jesus. In fact, he even said as much. I am the door. He's the door. He's the way through the door. He's the pathway into the door. He's the road into the door. He's the, yeah, it's him. But you enter this through here, through Jesus, the people of God. We might Today, we would say, the saved. Inside here is the, in the temple, the main building, and there are two sections. We have here, this is the holy place. Here is the holiest. You know, it's very creative here. They call it the holiest place. We sometimes call it the holy of holies. The holy of holies or holiest place and the holy place. Okay, and then you'll have various artifacts in there and stuff. Well, the thing is, inside here is the ark, inside of the Holy of Holies. And by the way, there's a, another veil curtain blocks access. Yes, it really. In the temple, it's a really thick one. I don't know how thick it was in the tabernacle, but the temple, oh yeah, it ain't going to be torn by any human. So, it is in here where God would manifest his presence and the only way and time to enter here was once a year. And only the high priest could enter because of God's glory, because of his holiness. And here's the interesting part. As you move from the outside, you go from the outside and you move inward, you move from, from sin through Jesus, getting closer and closer and closer to the holiness of God. By the way, from this point on, from, this would be you know, through Jesus, from salvation on, this is what we call sanctification today. This is the idea of us, God, uh, of us being made by the Holy Spirit more and more in the likeness of Christ, making us more and more holy, so that in the end, we'll be able to be free of the sin but you're moving further away from sin and closer and closer to the holiness of God. This is the separation from sin of the people of God. Oh, by the way, another idea in this is, is this. The people of God are inside here, right? Separated from the world. However, they are not totally withdrawn from the world. The Hebrews were told to go and tell others about God. They didn't do it. Their answer was, uh, no, we're not going to do that. They, we're, we're holier than that. Yeah, they were really so holy. Um, but yeah, they refused to evangelize. Well, Jesus says, okay, people of God, <laughs> um, go tell others. Do we? No, we should. But yes, there's a separation from the sinful world, and God's holiness is totally separate from it, and the only way to access it is by getting closer and closer to God, which God does through Jesus Christ, draws us in, and he does all that work. But this is a picture of the holiness of God. Now, what I've written down here is pretty much what I just described. The exterior, the sinful world, courtyard, the people of God, the holy place, the front area of the main building, and the holy of holies, or holiest place, location of the ark. Of course, I could get into a little bit about it's interesting that um, we have the ark here. And by the way, the ark has the mercy, pardon me, the mercy seat on it. You know, you know the mercy, mercy seat, picturing salvation and the grace and mercy of God. And oh, by the way, this is called the ark, right? 
Ark of the Covenant, right? Interesting wordplay here. The Ark of Noah was a vessel of salvation and mercy and grace, the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Interesting wordplay. So, what was going on? Well, we have here the separation, the drawing in to the Holy of Holies where God manifested himself. The only way to get there is through Jesus Christ. And if, you, if we want to be holy, we must, we must come closer and closer to God and further and further away from sin. Now, again, that's called sanctification. But what makes this holiest of holies? What makes this holy? God's presence. There's nothing inherently holy about the, about the back room of a building. Nothing. It is no more holy in and of itself than this place or this place or out. Nothing. What makes it holy? You're right. God himself. And we actually see that in Exodus 3, 5, and which Exodus 3, 5 says, then he said, this is God speaking, then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you were standing is holy ground. He's speaking to Moses here. What made this ground holy is the same thing that makes this room holy, or that room holy, or this holy. Same thing, God. If God had not shown up, it would have just been another bush on the ground. No more holy than the one that Moses probably passed a billion times halfway down the mountain. Who knows? It was holy because God himself was there. Wherever God is, that is a holy place. The temple or the tabernacle pictures the holiness of God. Now, I also said that the tabernacle, well, it's a foreshadowing of the temple because the temple was pretty much the permanent version of this. And... We've actually had, the Jews have had two temples. Herod, they have had Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, both of them destroyed. And by the way, I, there doesn't need to be a third temple because the temple is foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do in heaven and so forth. But anyway, if they build a third temple, it will be an abomination because it's basically saying, no, we don't need Jesus. We need the sacrifices. No, Jesus is, Jesus is the sacrifice. But I said that also that this is a picture of the church as well. How so? Well, here's what happened, if you remember from the Gospels. This veil separating the Holy of Holies from everything else, torn at the death of Jesus, giving access to God himself through Jesus Christ. And the, th this is a picture of the Basically, the separated out people of God, separated from the sinful world. Oh, by the way, ecclesia, the called out ones or set apart, often simply translated church. We are set apart from the world, yet we're still in the world because we're surrounded by the world, and we're supposed to be engaging with the world to share the good news with them so that they can come through Jesus. But here's the thing. They don't have to come to you know, the front door and say, hey, please let me in. Let me follow some rituals, and maybe you can get into here if I'm good enough, and then the priest can go in here for me. Jesus is the priest who's torn this down, has already done the work, so that all believers can just go straight to God through Jesus Christ. So the temple or the tabernacle is a picture ultimately not just of the things Jesus is going to do but also of the church as the ecclesia called out set us apart by God now what does scripture have to say if someone want to turn to psalms let's just psalm 71 verse 22 psalm 71 verse 22 and psalm uh, Psalm eighty nine eighteen says this, For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. And Isaiah 1, 4 says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. 
They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. And does someone want to look at Luke 4, verse 34? In all of these verses, God the Father, God the Son, are referred to as Holy One. Scripture tells us that God not only is holy himself, but that he is the Holy One. He is the definition of holiness. So we have that in Scripture. Also, Isaiah 6.3 says this, And one called to another and said, Holy, oh, by the way, this is something that's happening in heaven. He's seeing what's happening in heaven. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And we see that later again. Does someone want to turn to Revelation 4, verse 8? Here's an interesting little thing for you. Both of these passages are talking about something that is happening in heaven. So we have the heavens, the angelic angelic beings declaring in song that God is holy. But however, they don't just say holy. Holy, three times. Why? Well, the Father is holy. The Son is holy. The Spirit is holy. The triune God is holy. Or as Justin Peters often says, thrice holy. But what do we have here is we have the heavens declaring God is holy. The creatures that were created, that serve God, the angels, are singing the holiness of God. Do our songs declare the holiness of God? Do our songs proclaim the righteousness of God, declare and tell others about how God truly is holy. Well, they don't necessarily have to be the song, holy, holy, holy. I mean, we've probably all heard that song. It doesn't have to be that song. I mean, you can use other terms and say the same thing, but if the song is is talking about how righteous God is, how good God is, how beyond us God is, how perfect God is, that's dealing with, in various aspects with the holiness of God. But we see heaven, the angels, declaring through song God's holiness. Exodus 26.33 says this, and we've seen something else about the holiness. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. Remember that two-chambered room? Holy place, the holiest place. A veil right there. And it will separate the holiest, where the ark will be placed, from, well, whatever's in in there, the holy place. Now, what this shows us ultimately is that this veil has a meaning. This veil separates the holiness of God from everything else. Now, what is it that ultimately separates us from God? Yes, it is that three-letter word that the world hates, sin. Or as some people might say, oopsie-daisies, oopsie-whoopsies, bad choices. No, that's sin. It's sin. This veil is depicting our own sin. That's also part of why that veil was torn at the death of Jesus, because sin was nailed on the cross that day. And Jesus defeated sin. And because sin's defeated, well, that veil's not needed anymore. The idea of the temple being a foreshadowing or a picture of things to come or of things that have a deeper meaning related to Christ is actually taught in the New Testament. Colossians 6, I'm sorry, Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17 say this. Therefore, no, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. This is going back to the, the Levitical law, the, the Mosaic law regarding food and drink and the requirements that were set out in those. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink 
or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Again, all aspects of the law. Why? He says, verse 17, Paul writes, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, does someone want to turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1? In Hebrews, we're essentially told the same thing, what's known as types and shadows. And what we see is that the entire Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament, I'm going to summarize it, points to Christ. Everything. The entire Old Testament. So if anybody ever tries tries to tell you about a story in the Old Testament, make it all about you, it ain't about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Now, more precisely, it's about God's salvific work, which is Jesus Christ. So what we have here is that, as we see in Exodus, and as we have affirmed through Colossians and Hebrews, that the veil is a depiction of our sin separating us from the holiness of God. And the only way to overcome that is through the only one that can defeat sin, Jesus himself. Now, knowing all of this, all of this is God is holy. Okay? All of that tells us this. God is holy. So what? What about us? Someone want to turn to Leviticus 19, verse 2. All right, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And 1 Peter, who wants to turn to 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16. And so here we have the apostle quoting Leviticus. So, God's holy. So what? You be holy. Because God's holy, we should be holy. And by the way, this is not a call to partial holiness. It's not a call to okayness. It's not a call to just good enoughness. This is a call to this much holiness, 100% perfection. Except here's the problem. We'll never get there on our own. So I've heard people say, that's not fair for God to tell us that we should be 100% holy if we can't be 100% holy. That's unfair. And my answer is, you're right, and God knows that. That is not unfair. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit, to do that for us. And so, how to be holy? Basically, say being holy or being made holy is sanctification. It's done by God. So I've written down here five things that we, lack of a better term, that we do. Ultimately, these are really submitting and surrendering to the work of, of the Holy Spirit in us. But the five things that that help a person or make a whole person holy? First, faith in Christ alone. We cannot be holy apart from Jesus Christ. Those who deny Jesus Christ will not ever be holy. They may do good things. They may be good people by the world's definition, but they're not holy. Why? Well, as I said before, there's two options when it comes to being like God. There's holy, not holy. There's righteous, not righteous. That's it. You only pick one of the two. And if we're not having faith in Christ, if we're apart from Christ, we are not holy. So it requires that we have faith in Jesus Christ. Second, submission to God's authority, to his holiness, and to his person. And that's where a lot of people say, "Uh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to surrender to myself. But we're supposed to surrender to God. So surrendering to God Spending time with God in his word and in prayer. Now, many Christians spend time in God's word and in prayer in church. Why? They pray in church. Many pastors have their people, or ask people to open up the Bibles. So they spend time there. Some go to Sunday school or small group and 
hopefully they open the Bible and pray there. But I've, as I've often said, what about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? We need to spend time in prayer and in the Word of God on those days too. Here's a way to get healthy. Take this plan to any doctor, any nutritionist, and, and you'll love their reaction. Tell them you found a new diet plan guaranteed to make you physically healthy. On Sunday, this is how many calories you're going to eat each day. On Sunday, none. Monday, none. Tuesday, one meal. That's it, one meal. Wednesday, nothing. Thursday, nothing. Friday, nothing. Saturday, nothing. Take this, this diet plan to any nutritionist or doctor and ask them, hey, if I have one meal a week, will that be good for me? What are they going to tell you? You're going to be very tired. You're going to be sick. You're going to be hungry. And you're going to see a whole lot of health problems. Here's the problem. Scripture says that the Word of God is our spiritual food. And yet, so many Christians do this. One meal or maybe even just a snack. Nope, 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 nope. And say, see, I'm spiritually healthy. You're starving yourself. We got to eat our food that day and 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 that day, not just on Sunday. So yeah, we got to spend time with God in prayer and in his word every day. We also must uh, not just spend time with God in, uh, every day through his word and through prayer. We also must be, be serving God's kingdom. We must be working for God's kingdom. Doing the kingdom work, do that by serving others. Or, as the Bible shows us, love God. If we love God, we're going to want to serve others, and we're going to want to serve God. So by working for God's kingdom, we will be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. But also, proclaiming. I was trying to avoid the word evangelism, but it's almost unavoidable. <laughs> evangelism. You also could include discipleship in here. Basically, love others. By loving God and loving others and living out those things, if we do that, God will use that to sanctify us. Ultimately, all of this is not stuff that we do to sanctify ourselves. This is all done in response to the work that God is doing in us. This is all done in response to what Jesus has done. This is all done in response to our faith. I heard one theologian say, I forget who it was recently, but I saw it where he, where he said that works do not justify us, but works are a natural result of our justification in Christ. If we are saved, works are a natural byproduct, but they're a result of what God's doing. They're never something that we do to get stuff from God. God uses it but it's all about submitting to him. And so God uses all this to sanctify his people or, as I say there, make them holy. 